It's great to be here, even though I'm on the other side of the planet. It's, uh, it's almost 5 a.m. here. Um, so here in Peru, people often ask me where I'm from, and my response is it's complicated. Uh, I was born in India, and when I was 10 years old, my family moved to Australia. Um, and my last job in Australia was as a software engineer with Suncorp in their Drupal team when we were still on Drupal 6. So I've been here in Peru for almost 10 years. And I've got a strong connection with Brisbane. Let me just share my screen. So I've got a strong connection with, um, with Brisbane. My wife's family live there, and uh, they live in a, a suburb in the west of Brisbane called Forest Lake. And you might recognize where this photo was taken. So Peru has been uh, hard hit by COVID, really hard hit. So we were number five in the world for the number of COVID cases, even though Peru, as far as population goes, is not much that much bigger than Australia. And we were also the world's deadliest COVID hotspot. So on the 26th of February, Latin America reported its first case of COVID. And not that much long after that, on the 16th of March, Peru went into a complete lockdown. So there were um, soldiers in the street with, with guns. It was the, the economy came to a complete stop. And when I heard about the news of the lockdown, it was a shock for everyone. I went out and got myself a, a packet of my favorite coffee. Yeah, I had some interesting priorities. Uh, but we also realized that there were many people in our community, in our city, that would really suffer through this time. So there are thousands of Venezuelan refugees that live in our city, and they sell things in the street to, to make a living, and they normally just make enough to, um, to, make, to get, have food for that day. And we felt that these were the most vulnerable people in our society, and they had no social security, uh, no family or savings. So we got together a few different organizations, a few local churches, a Venezuelan association, and we called ourselves Alianza de Amor, which in Spanish means the Alliance of Love. Uh, and we applied for some funds through a mission. So I work for a Christian mission here in Peru. We applied for some funds, EMAC for emergency aid, and we got started. We got a, a bunch of volunteers together. And um, so we bought food in, in box, so here we're purchasing potatoes, um, and we packed those potatoes into, into bags, and we distributed that, uh, that food to people. And my job at this time was to, to pack the, the potatoes. So we distributed food to about 150 people uh, when we started. The next week was 300, and two weeks later it was 600. And we had a team of about eight volunteers. Most of them were Venezuelans themselves. And they managed a bunch of spreadsheets and sent out WhatsApp messages individually to, to each person, inviting people to come to a pickup point at the, at the time. But there were some major problems with the system, especially as, we, as the number of people grew rapidly. Uh, it was completely unscalable. There was no transparency. People will come to us and say, my neighbor got a food package this week um, and we didn't, even though we registered at the same time. Uh, we had a secondary problem where uh, we got some initial funding and that was going to run out very quickly. And it soon became obvious that we needed a, a, a better solution. So I chatted with a good friend in Lima, the capital, named Eduardo, and he worked remotely for Lullabot. And we planned out a simple application. And in a few years, in just a few hours, I put together a really simple Drupal site where people could register online with their details and place themselves on a Google map. And the plan was to let people know slowly about the registration page um, because we just had this site um, on one of my mission's shared, shared service. But in a couple of days, we had two and a half thousand registrations and this was a problem because there was no way we could produce this number of food packages um, we couldn't manage that number of people uh, and we didn't even have the funds to be able to get food to this number of people 
So we um, we close the registrations, um, and the, and we continued working um, just with the same number of people um, that we had before, until um, we could work out a way that we could scale more. And so we frantically started building more f functionality into the, the application, but we realized very quickly um, we just couldn't work fast enough. And this is when we posted in uh, Drupal, the Australia Drupal.org um, group, and um, Vladimir and Jana joined our team. So our data at the time was uh, a mess. So people could register and we asked for their Venezuelan uh, ID card number, which was a number that everyone had. But even though we asked for this number, people registered with four diff with different numbers. Um, and this was a problem because we had, and quite understandably, people who are in great need sometimes registered multiple times, hoping to get multiple food packages. And people could potentially register um, four times with four different numbers. So we had to do a bit of a cleanup. We had lots of people registering with the same phone numbers as well. We also had some technical challenges because um, almost no one had laptops in this community. They had old phones, very poor internet, and um, almost no one know, knew how to use email. WhatsApp was kind of the, the main way of, of working. Our philosophy was, was minimalist. We stuck with, with um, a theme, and we, we'll see the theme a bit later when Vladimir present, presents. And we delivered every week. Our food deliveries were every week, so we would build the minimal functionality that we needed just to survive the, the following week. And there were lots of manual processes and we were, we were happy to, to have a balance between manual processes and the systems till we had enough functionality in the system for that to, to take over. And I really appreciated um, Vladimir. When we had a problem, uh, he would often suggest a, a solution and uh, he would say, let me create a card for that. Uh, and we used Trello to manage our, our, our process. And Jana too identified things that we could do, um, do better. For example, bulk, using bulk imports to get data into Drupal, reporting views, and we exported data out of Drupal to, um, as some things were just simpler to do, um, to uh, do in Excel. And the outcome was before it took six people working throughout the week, um, but now with the system, um, once we've gone through a few iterations, just two people working for five hours we get through the system. There were still some complications because we wanted to prioritize people with disabilities and people with vulnerabilities. We had to do individual food deliveries, for example, um, to people who, who were either sick or, or couldn't come to our delivery points. So we had a system where we could identify people who are, are next in the line. Um, we, uh, we did this outside of, of Drupal with um, and we imported this back into Drupal. Um, during, um, we would then, we had an, an API um, connected to the WhatsApp API where we could send people an, a, a customized invite where we told people where um, they could come to pick up their food and at what time. And they could log into the system and they could either confirm or, uh, or reject that particular food delivery. And at the actual delivery point, we had um, a list of people who were there, the people who had confirmed, and we could click a button to flag um, that they'd received food. And so in the, in the five months that we were working, we delivered 137 tons of food to about 3,000 uh, families and individuals. And um, though uh, the money that we needed ran out almost every few weeks, um, we reached out to our contacts, our friends, through the mission we had lots of contacts, and people kept donating money, and we were able to continue. Um, we, we were burning through about um, 10,000 Australian dollars a week buying food, but uh, amazingly, 
people just um, kept giving so we could, we could continue. And why did we do this? So the project wasn't without great cost. We did everything we could to protect ourselves and keep our volunteers safe. But several of our volunteers ended up getting COVID. And sadly, one of them um, died suddenly of a, a heart complication. It was fantastic also hearing stories of so many people who, whose lives were impacted through this. So for example, this is Leonella. Um, she lost her job immediately when the lockdown happened. She worked in, as a hairdresser. And um, she was so thankful for us through this process because it, it helped her family get through this. She's got two kids. And she also volunteered with a project, um, which, was, which was fantastic. So a huge um, thank you to lots of people who, who helped us. Uh, these are some of the lessons that we, we learned. Um, just keeping things simple. We, from my experience as a, a software engineer, especially uh, in the past, the more complicated a system is, the more, the, the more room you have for, for problems. So we kept things as simple as possible. If there was something that we could do manually that didn't take too much time, we, we took that option. And we also didn't just automate an existing process. Um, we used to have peop 100 people line up and they would be put in a certain order and it would take them about um, an hour for them to receive food through, the, um, through the, the manual process and through spreadsheets that we had before. But um, with the system, um, we were able to streamline that process. So we arrived about 30 minutes before people arrived with the food. And um, when people arrived, people normally didn't have to wait more than five or 10 minutes. And for us, this was a huge win because in a time where you have this incredible, incredibly contagious virus, it just wasn't helpful having people together um, for an hour. We also used what we knew, um, and I, I, it was great to have contacts within the community. And um, we also got, um, we got people involved in the project physically as well. We just couldn't distribute this amount of food without having lots of people on, on deck. So a huge thank you to uh, Vladimir and Jana. Um, they were able to work faster than I imagined was possible. Um, I'd say they were 10x developers, just being able to work fast. For example, we had to clean up lots of data um, and they were able to write out uh, SQL queries uh, and create views where we were able to quickly identify um, problems in the system. And also thank you to the Drupal community for helping build this great tool that we could use in this situation. Thanks to all the people who donated funds to the project. And I also thank God for, being, for the opportunity to be in a place of great need and to be able to serve. So, um, and thank you for, to you guys for, for giving me the opportunity today. And now over to Vladimir. Th there is one more thing I'd, um, that's a, a, our next challenge. At the moment, our, our huge challenge is to help people find work. So the economy is slowly opening up, but we still have thousands of people without work. Um, our mission has hired one person to help with content, so they convert PDF documents into HTML, and I've given some very basic training so someone can um, create content on our, on our websites. So uh, if, you've got, got, if you have ideas on how we can um, create jobs, if you've got content, a simple process, uh, a manual process that, um, where we could hire people, um, I'm happy to, to rent a little space and, and some laptops uh, and get people working. So I'd love to get your ideas on, on what we could do now. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, switching to presentation mode again. Thanks, David, for presenting that early in the morning. I know it's, um, and I would really like to thank you to uh, yeah, giving us opportunity to actually participate in the project, but also uh, being always accommodating. 
in terms of time and in terms of also trying to get find the right balance. I know it's not been easy here and uh, sitting here in Australia. So how it's all started, uh, we, at one point we lost basically most of the clients because they were all in uh, entertainment and uh, music and advertisement, which basically were gone in Australia in a second. But then, uh, and let me know if you can't see my screen, but uh, you should be able to see it now. David posted this message on the 13th of May, 2020. And uh, it's very interesting how, you know, uh, the different perspective of uh, what different countries are going through during um, this year. Uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more and more stories. But yeah, that post kind of just dropped into my uh, email as we pretty much basically lost most of the like 99% of income. And I said, oh, that's a great idea. Like it's a, basically we can concentrate on and um, move on. And uh, we contacted David, he responded pretty much straight away and we started doing it. So this part of the talk is more of a technical talk and some of the uh, technical issues that we were uh, trying to solve or we were helped by someone else to solve. Again, uh, I uh, put this talk together saying it's a technical part, but it's again more so it will suit everyone else. So I'll just con uh, keep that in mind. So the first challenge was to find the hosting. So when David approached us, he said, hey, we have the shared hosting and it's basically not coping and the people are coming in and we expect even more people gonna just, um, it just got up you know, increase day after day after day. And at the same time, major Drupal hosting and not only Drupal, a lot of companies are releasing the article saying, hey, we know it's tough. We know it's um, kind of problematic time. So we are there to help you out there. And top three Drupal hosting companies, they all posted the article. So I just told it, hey, how about I'll, we'll contact uh, few of them and see what we're gonna get up. The Pantheon was the first one to chase and actually deliver the platform to work for us. Uh, at that time, I personally haven't touched Pantheon for about four years. And to be honest, they grew quite a lot. So they gave us a platform originally till July, but that was enough to, you know, to just go there and put something and not worry about the load of traffic. I'll come back to the traffic later, but again, big thumbs up to Pantheon um, for doing that. Uh, when, as David mentioned before, when it's sense of urgency is there and you already have something you want to host it and there's not much budget, it's very actually tough to find the business. So a bit more technical stuff about Pantheon. So if you never used the managed hosting before or if you did use managed hosting before, you know, you have usually multiple environments that where you can test stuff. So dev test and your production uh, in Pantheon, they quite specific. So dev is your master and then you do some tagging. I'm sure you'll find more information uh, that in documentation, I just want to do give you a bit of a specific what we de dealt with. And again, as I said, I haven't dealt with Pantheon for a number of years. Uh, it was quite interesting to, you know, jump on a new system and try to get it up and running very quickly. Uh, you, you have a bunch of tools there, database controls, enabling HTTPS backups and so on and so forth. Um, quite a unique feature, I think, between the, for managed Drupal hostings is that you have an ability to switch between SFTP and Git mode. Uh, I know other managed hostings have it in one or two iterations, but it basically means you either pushing code into Git re repository or you can actually switch Git off and upload files directly. And probably one of the most unique features, and it would be interesting to see if um, Pantheon would help uh, with their experience on the one of the Drupal initiatives is actually automatically updating Drupal core on the fly. So they have this th thing called upstream. So once you turn the git on, you actually have this upstream bot saying, hey, your Drupal out of date, please update it. So I thought it was kind of a nice touch. 
So again, a uh, few other things that uh, I knew that they were there, but I didn't know if they were stick around or they moved on. So they used their own CLI tools. So one of them was Terminus. There were a few challenging, but nothing too big. I, I was able to use Drush, but with a bit of a you know Pantheon spin. So when you run something like uh, Terminus Drush Cache Rebuild, uh, yep, they would. That's how you actually run Drush without SSH into it. You would actually use the uh, application called Terminus to contact rather than SSH in and trying to do stuff there. Uh, but overall, again, we didn't have, from the hosting perspective, we, we got managed hosting. It was sustainable. And yeah, it gave us all the tools to kind of put Alliance the more on manage hosting platform now another feature that pantheon gives to all its clients is actually a paid subscription to new relic new relic is a great tool to see how your application performing over the specific load it has a lot of features i'm not going to go to it but weekly you would get statistics like that saying hey here's your average load time here's your views here's your index of your application, Abdex, something, some metrics they use internally, and errors if you have any. So you can see it all here. You can see your quietest day, busiest day. Uh, but also they send you these stats and it's very important because like it's split by weeks and you can see actually the load. So this is page views in thousand. So this is how many pages were viewed and keep in mind that this is not a simple project this project where a l a most of the users are logged in and in drupal when you're logged in most of you know um, cache is switched off so or not working because you're authenticated user or, or doesn't work to the extent where which you can use cache if it's a anonymous user so there was a heavy hit on the user and you can see there are spikes to you know 12,000 um, uh, page hits a month. Uh, maybe for large traffic sites, it doesn't look very bad, but again, keep in mind that all of those users are authenticated. So once they go in, a lot of cache mechanism Drupal provides for uh, anonymous users are switched off. But as you can see, there was constant growth. So this is the first week we went live. Last week of May, uh, 6,500 page views. And it went up and peaked at about 30 and a half, uh, 15, so uh, actually, no, sorry, <laughs> 17,000 for views. And then kind of, uh, you can see that was a massive peak there. But again, still uh, was a bit of a downtime. There were some changes in uh, policies in Peru. And then it hit again because the country closed up, closed again. And correct me, David, if I'm wrong, I'm just uh, going off the numbers here. And this is going into the uh, late August, and November. You can see uh, still huge load going almost to 17,000 a week, and then going into 10,000. And as far as I saw, the deliveries are still going there. So there's still, um, yeah. So it's still operational website to this day, which is great news. Uh, David put this um, uh, website straight to GitHub and it's open and public. Here's a URL for it. Um, uh, so if you feel like helping out, jump on and uh, yeah, and just uh, help out uh, as a developer or with the suggestions as well. Please contact David. I'll put the contact details in the end, but also Again, when David invited us, um, at the moment you can see there is already eight contributors to the project, including myself, David, and uh, six others. I really thank everyone to actually, you know, raising hand, helping out. I know it's not like sometimes easy or um, finding a busy life. For example, Eduardo was, you know, trying to juggle his work and doing stuff after hours. I know um, the Hussein as well. Uh, so they were actually helping outside of their normal work, which is pretty impressive. I think it's a yeah, great commitment and great uh, showcase of the open source. 
Again, website, the interesting bit, uh, I think it was done before we came on board that the uh, aloe vera theme, aloe vera theme was uh, used and uh, it's a quite an interactive theme. So if you go to Alianza Demo or website, you can click around or hover around, you'll see this is what's going to replace Bartik. Uh, and it looks amazing. And uh, aloe vera theme until recently, and recently, I mean real until last month, it was a separate theme you can download, put it on and use it. And that's exactly what we did. Um, I think it's still used at that time. It's still used SAS. I might be wrong. Uh, but now, uh, as Drupal Core, I think they're moving to post-CSS. Again, this information needs to be checked, but I think that's what it is. And recently, you can actually see that it was marked as obsolete. And the reason for that is it's actually now in Drupal core. So 9.1, Drupal 9.1, beta 1 was released this week, as I mentioned before in the news. And you can actually use this theme now if you install 9.1 or download it and use it the um, latest stable version from Drupal.org website if you're using 8.9, 9.0. We're still using 8.9 and it works quite well. In fact, we didn't do many CSS changes. Here's Mike Herschel. He's actually the person who is uh, doing most of the development or he's lead on the aloe vera theme. Uh, in fact, because once they pledged, once they pledged that aloe vera going to make it to Drupal core, I think at the, about the same time Drupal announced they're going to support IE 11. So I, so he went extra mile to, uh, you know, actually make sure Oliveira and the team as well. So he, not not just him, but everyone who contributed to Oliveira team uh, went extra mile to make sure it's actually compatible with a 11 and works with a 11. So whoever installs Drupal can still use it in a 11 if needed. And I guess for the last technical bit, uh, David asked me to say, okay, uh, can you just explain how the delivery was done? So this is a very development techy bit, uh, but the idea behind it was, again, uh, first step we implemented was for people to reply. Uh, once people were assigned to delivery, they can log, uh, they would receive the message through WhatsApp app. And I think uh, that can be the whole different presentation about how it's done. So there was a service that was sending messages through WhatsApp rather than SMSs. And, then, and they would have a link, they would log into the website and they would confirm they can make it or they can't make it and then can change it. And this is the view for, this is a Drupal view. And this is a view for uh, delivery. Uh, so when people were delivering stuff, they could easily tick off other people and say, okay, deliver, deliver, deliver. So they would check and uh, see if um, they can uh, yeah, deliver some stuff to people. The problem was with the original views, we just create a simple link. So every time they click deliver, the page would reload uh, and, you know, the scroll would go up. But the biggest problem was it was quite slow. So to reload the page and then load users again, that would take a number of, you know, three, five, ten. 10. Again, also if you're doing it on a mobile phone, uh, the, depending on the connection. So David, at uh, one week, he came back and said, we did the delivery, it works great, it's just very, very slow, how we can improve it. And I thought, hey, this is a very good, uh, very good case to try a Drupal Ajax API and see if it actually makes a difference. You know, maybe the call would go and I have no idea if we can improve it, the speed or not. And I said, like, like I would go for Ajax API and uh, see if it works or not. So instead of actually clicking, clicking deliver and reloading the page, we would just let uh, Drupal Ajax API to handle it and refresh just one row. And that's exactly what we did. So now there is going to be a bit of code. So if you're not a coder, just uh, stick with me. I'm almost done. So the first thing was 
uh, you can see this link called deliver. So this link deliver would go to Ajax slash to deliver and then it will go which node and which user. And uh, for Ajax API, all you need to specify is a controller you're using. So in this particular case, it's an update delivery function in delivery controller and say, okay, Ajax equals true. To back, uh, jumping into the controller, here is update delivery function. And you can see the parameters we're passing in is actually a node, a user, which can be empty a field name. And by default, it's field delivered and then Ajax itself. So why are we passing field name? We actually use the, we use the same controller, the same function in three different cases. So, and here they are. So first was food delivered and food delivered was, um, yeah, exactly what I showed you before. So was item delivered or not? But then we decided to use the same function for user checking. Remember when user is actually checking, they can go and opt in saying, yep, I'm going to be there. I'm going to pick it up. But then if something happens, uh, any circumstances we decided to actually bring opt out options or if they would knew they can't make it they can opt out and let the delivery know they won't be there so it can be redistributed or you know it uh, the logistics can be adjusted so we use the same function three different cases and uh, here's the actually bit that um, so we did the all the updates you know when they click okay this item was delivered so we updated the delivery date, we saved the actual user, uh, but then uh, for Ajax API, and that's kind of why I, I have this love-hate relationship with Ajax API, they have this thing called a add command, which is a command stack they send as a response, and it's a PHP way to tell front-end how to act. Again, I'll repeat it. So this is a PHP way to tell front end how to act. I think it's uh, why a lot of us actually in situation at the moment where a lot of front end frameworks taking over the functionality because, you know, sometimes you have to separate. There is a front end and there is a back end. But anyway, here there are two commands. So when we click deliver, two things happen. First one is a replace command. So we're actually replacing the row. Um, uh, of the message and saying this user de was delivered, uh, the package was delivered to this user. And the second command, which actually removes command, it removes the button for to deliver it. So once the um, once they click deliver, the button disappear, and that's what the second command does. Again, um, quite a controversial. Uh, set of things introduced in Drupal 8, but it's still there and worked fine. And in fact, uh, when we first introduced it, I was waiting for David to come back and say what actually happened. And he said, look, now it works like it flies. So it, it's really great. So for me, it was actual assurance that, hey, Drupal API actually does a great work in the right conditions. Uh, in the end of the functions, all we did is just if Ajax, which in our case was, send a response sometimes on the user pages and else is actually a before part, before we had Ajax, it will actually redirect to the particular page. In this case, it's a, either was delivery page or something like that. Again, didn't get to it straight away, was, um, you know, took a number of iterations, but you know, like you don't have extensions, you cannot ask for extensions because the team goes and plans early in the week and then delivers for the rest of the week. So we were trying to get, uh, being mindful of everyone's time, trying to get this functionality in, making sure that they also have enough time to test it and it's not failing on the day, which uh, I think it's a good perspective to have when you're building the software applications. David posted another great post uh, on October the 3rd. I really recommend you, if you haven't seen it, to jump and read it. Uh, and it summarized basically what happened and the, yeah, how Drupal actually helped uh, in that situation. So I actually stole the, uh, I actually stole the David slide uh, and you can actually, uh, how you can help. So you can contact David 
on this email uh, if you want to donate or if you're looking for a ways he as and he mentioned before they're looking for a ways to change the system to help Peruvians to find uh, work at the moment and see if you know something simple like po job postings or offer offer of the services posting can make a difference and actually be an next iteration of this project so yeah i think um, that's it for me so if you have any questions for david or for me uh feel free to yeah unmute and ask I don't have questions, but I have two things about Pantheon that you talked about, Vladimir. Yep. Um, the one-click updates are really cool, but as far as I'm aware, they're still not compatible with composer-based Drupal sites. So that's something you need to be aware of. I'm aware of that. <laughs> um, and I, sorry if I zoned out or something, but I don't know if you talked about multi-dev or if you've played with the multi-dev. I didn't, I didn't play with multi-dev uh, as much as I would like to. Uh, um, do you want to yeah. talk a bit about multi-dev? Uh, yeah, just really quickly. Multi-dev is probably my favorite Pantheon feature. Um, so you've got the, the really strict dev test live environments which are fixed, um, but the multi-dev is your sort of, you control it and you get a certain number of sandboxes um, where you can really, really quickly spin up a different version of your site that's completely separate. Uh, you do it all through the UI, so it copies down a copy of your database from whichever environment you want and the code. Um, and you can either spin it up from a Git branch um, so you can, uh, you know, test out a feature that you're still building or work collaboratively with someone on it. Um, you can get user feedback really easily because the multi-devs still have like an externally available URL. So you can do a thing, send it to the client, they go, no, nah, I don't like it, or yeah, I love it, and, you know, go from there without actually messing with your production pipeline. Um, and the other thing that I've made massive use of is just spinning up a local dev for the non-technical people who want to get familiar with it. So you give them their own multi-dev, and they can just go ham and change data and delete things and play with it. And then at the end of the day, you just get rid of it and doesn't matter what they did, but they had the opportunity to get their hands dirty in a very accurate replica of the system without any fuss. Yep, it's something similar to like dev environments and other um, managed hosting providers, yeah, and it, it, it's quite useful from what I read. I just never had a time. And as I mentioned before, the Pantheon is quite interesting because dev is master, so mm. it um, takes a bit of a different approach to what other hostings do. But thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, you, you're right. It is exactly like other dev environments, but it's just so easy to spin them up is the main thing um, and to, to pull in the data. <laughs> 